Okay. <coughs> so what I'm talking, <coughs> excuse me. So what I'm talking about is going to be adapting quantum error correcting to specific channels, which um, I've done this work with Andrew Fletcher and Wheaton Lying, and you've already heard about some results on, along these lines. Um, and you'll hear more. I'm going to um, talk here. I have an outline. Okay, so I'll start with a blatantly commercial advertisement. I will then do a very quick review of stabilizer codes, although nobody doesn't. Everybody knows what I'm going to say. Then I'll talk about how to find optimal recovery from error using semi-definite programming. Then I'll talk, say some words about error correction for the amplitude damping channel. And then I'll talk about this new class of co codes that Riton Lang has discovered with me um, last summer. And they're a special class of these code word stabilized codes. And we just posted the paper on the archive. And then I'll talk about a generalization of Lang's codes, which we're still working on. So the advertisement. So there are postdocs for quantum, well, one postdoc in quantum algorithms at MIT, we have the funding for, and we'd like to have, you know, we'd like to hire someone, and we'll start looking at applications in mid-January, so please tell everyone you know who wants a postdoc to apply. And so let's go to this review of stabilizer codes. So the traditional way of doing this quantum error correcting codes with stabilizer codes is you choose an abelian subgroup of the tensor products of Pauli matrices where the sigma i's are the Pauli matrices of the identity. And now I'm going to say something slightly more general than the completely traditional method. You see, choose simultaneous eigenvalues plus or minus one for each generator of the subgroup and these operations all commute. So there exists a uh, simultaneous eigenspace for all these eigenvalues, and this eigenspace is your quantum error correcting code. So how do you recover from this quantum error correcting code? Well, what you do is you measure all these eigenvalues for the generator of the subgroup. This is the syndrome. And if they're all the ones you specified, you know your code word isn't the code, so you're in good shape. But if there's an error, some of these eigenvalues, or if there's a correctable error, some of these eigenvalues will not be the ones you specified in that standard way. Some of these eigenvalues are not going to be one. Some of them will be minus one. So now you want to figure out what errors would give you this syndrome. There's a whole bunch of errors that will give you this syndrome. So what you do is you choose the minimum weight Hamming error or minimum Hemingway error that could have caused the syndrome. Of course, as we heard earlier, if the phase and bit errors are not equally likely, this isn't necessarily the best thing to do. Maybe you want to choose the most probable error that could have caused the syndrome, which if, say, phase errors are 10 times more likely than bit errors, you want to choose uh, an error which has a lot more sigma z's in it than sigma x's and then you apply the Pauli matrices that correct this error. So, you know, if you choose the symmetric depolarizing channel, the maximum likelihood error is the same as the minimum Hamming rate error. So, you can ask, <coughs> is a traditional recovery the best thing to do? Suppose we know what the error model is. For example, suppose we are using the amplitude damping channel, and we want to encode using the five qubit code. Well, what we can do is we can compute the optimal error recovery and compare it with a standard method and see how much better we do. And it turns out we do quite a bit better. So how do we compute this? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to use semi-definite programming. So what is semi-definite programming? Well, it's a generalization of linear programming. So linear programming is a technique for if you have a region of space 
of n-dimensional space bounded by hyperplanes, and you want to find the maximum value of some linear function in this region, um, it works really well, <coughs> and you can find it. So semi-definite programming lets you optimize a linear function over an affine subset of positive semi-definite matrices. So the semi-definite form and semi-definite program in standard form might be something like maximum, or I think the standard form actually is minimum, minimize the trace of xc, so this is your linear function, subject to x greater than or equal to zero, that's a semi-definite constraint, so you're looking over positive semi-definite matrices, and a sub i x is equal to b sub i. So this is some set of linear constraints on your um, spaces you're looking at. And the really nice thing about semi-definite programming is that there are efficient algorithms for it. And actually, maybe the even nicer thing is that there are good software packages available for it. So if you have a semi-definite program, you can, you don't have to write a new software package to solve it. You can take one off the shelf, and these are going to work a lot better than anything you could have written yourself, and then you run it. So why is R? So how is what we're doing a semi-definite program? <coughs> well, what we're going to do is we're going to consider an encoder. In our example case, that was a five qubit code, so we're encoding one qubit into five qubit, and then we stick it through a channel. And now our semi-definite program opera optimizes this recovery. So instead of measuring the syndrome and then computing the maximum likely error from it, we just look over all possible quantum operations that we could apply and say which quantum operations maximize the fidelity of the recovery, tensor the error. Well, okay, so we're going to combine the encoder and the error into a single operation E, so which of them maximize the recovery, um, not tensor, um, composed with the encoding and the channel, so the fidelity between this and that. Well, we haven't quite told you what we're going to optimize because if you think back, there are several possible fidelities that you might want to maximize when you're considering quantum error correcting codes. And so Barnum et al. showed that they were all equivalent asymptotically for the, you know, for the, you know, for considering the quantum channel capacity. But we can try to actually maximize the average fidelity or the entanglement fidelity or the worst case input state fidelity. So the first two optimization problems can be solved using semi-definite programming. And the last one it doesn't look like it can. So since these are all equivalent asymptotically, it might be a good thing to do is to look at one of these. And what we've done, concentrated on, well, maybe because it's more quantum somehow than the average fidelity, is the entanglement fidelity. So how do we turn our problem into a semi-definite program? What we're going to do is use this, something called the Jamiolkovsky isomorphism. So we turn a matrix A into a vector. So if you have an n by m matrix A, it turns into a 1 by n times m vector just by writing all the um, coefficients in a big line. And then this <coughs> transforms as BAC is equal to B tensor C transpose A. Good. So what happens when you have a quantum channel and you, how do you represent it using this um, Jamiolkovsky isomorphism? Well, if you have a channel, <coughs> E of rho is equal to summation K, AK rho, AK dagger, what this turns into is E of rho is the trace over the input. So this, um, this um, double cat A is um, 
you know, has one, you know, has, uh, is a tensor product of the input side and the output side, essentially. And so you trace over the input, which I think we essentially represent in the second half here, of I tensor rho bar, or rho, rho conjugate, X sub B. So you take your input state, multiply it by your, this new channel, this channel turns into a matrix on these things and then you trace out the um, input, say, input part of your um, quantum state. <coughs> and Xe is just the sum over K of all these cross operators of AK, AK, AK transpose when you turn them into vectors, or AK, AK dagger. And so this is a positive semi-definite matrix. And since we're going to be optimizing over recovery operations, optimizing over positive semi-definite matrices is good. And the condition that it's trace preserving turns into just the trace over one of these um, two tensor components of X sub B is the identity. Okay. So we're maximizing entanglement fidelity. How do you represent entanglement fidelity in this funny way of looking at quantum channels? Well, the entanglement fidelity of an input rho is trace of rho summation k, a k rho, a k dagger, which you can rewrite as summation over k, trace of rho, a k squared. And if you go back and look at this representation of the channel, it's not too hard to see that the fidelity is just <coughs> the inner product rho x sub b rho. And the x sub p here is a positive semi-definite matrix and rho is a vector. So we're trying to maximize this trace x sub b with rho, this matrix. And for the semi-definite program, what you can do is you can find, combine the input row with the error process E to get a single matrix C sub E row. And so this represents the encoding and the channel. And then you maximize trace XR times C E row, subject to the constraints that the recovery operator is a valid quantum operation, which is just this positive semi-definite condition and this linear condition. So you're maximizing a linear function over positive semi-definite matrices, and this is a semi-definite program. Great. So what happens when we apply it? Well, <coughs> I'll tell you what, show you what happens for the five qubit code. So this blue line, if you have the amplitude damping channel, and this is a damping parameter, um, Okay, I think we'll go into what the amplitude damping channel is later. It probably should be before the slide, but I think everyone knows what it is anyway. So here's a damping parameter. And the, you know, standard recovery looks like this. And what you get when you don't do any recovery, you just send a single qubit through the channel unprotected. It looks like that. So here's your five qubit code with the standard recovery. Here's your five qubit code with the optimized recovery. And here is your unencoded qubit. So if you were using the standard recovery, you would, the quantum error correct code improves it over to a damping parameter of 0.27. And if you use this better recovery, it kind of doubles it. So actually, it improves quite a bit. Now, there's another thing you can do, which we haven't concentrated on very much, but um, I guess Reimpel and Werner, and I think Kosu might also have done it, is the encode, you take, uh, you know, you fix the channel and fix the recovery operator, you can optimize the encoder. So that's also a semi-definite program. So now you, you know, there's a, good idea. What you could do is you could first fix the encoder and optimize the recovery. Now fix the recovery operator, optimize the encoder. And you keep on doing these things 
your fidelity is going to keep on going up. <coughs> so eventually, this should converge to some local optimization in the space of encoder recovery pairs. And I have stolen this slide from Reimpel and Verner to show what happens when you do this for the amplitude damping channel acting on four qubits. So if you take the amplitude damping channel acting on four qubits and just send something directly through the da amplitude damping channel, your damping parameter, you know, you get this dashed line. Now you can also encode it with a four qubit stabilizer code that Debbie Lung and um, this should say Debbie Lung et al. because it's Lung and Yamamoto and Nielsen and, no, Chuang and who else? I can't hear. Yeah, yeah, Chuang, Nielsen and Yamamoto and Lung. So I should have said et al. here, but I forgot. <laughs> so you put this, you encode it with this code, you send it through the channel and you optimize your recovery you get this um, thing. If you use the standard recovery, you get a uh, curve which is quite a bit below it. And if you do this optimal iteration between the encoding operation and the recovery operation, you do a little bit better. But it's still, you know, somehow it tracks this stabilizer code and then when the stabilizer's code starts doing worse than just setting a qubit unprotected, it starts tracking this unprotected thing. So I don't really know what this means, but I think it's interesting. Okay. Now, if you're in, if no, if you have had some experience with optimization, you know that the first thing you do when you get a linear program is you look at its dual. <coughs> so semi-definite programs also, like linear programs, have duals. And there's very nice relations between the dual and the original value of the sub indefinite program. So the optimal value of the dual program is equal to the optimal value of the original program. But the dual program, if the original program is a maximization thing, like ours is, you're trying to maximize the fidelity, the dual program is a minimization and vice versa. So that means if you have some feasible point of the original program, so that is some recovery operator, then it gives you a lower bound on the actual fidelity. If you have some feasible point on the dual program, and that's not a recovery operator, it's some, I don't know how to describe it, it's, <laughs> it's some set, it's some point in some um, semi, uh, some semi-definite matrix using some, with some linear inequalities which don't, in this case, don't seem to have a really good intuitive interpretation, that gives you an upper bound on how well you could possibly do. And if you solve those, these, if you solve the dual program and the upper bound exactly, then they would converge to the optimal value. Of course, what I, you know, the problem with this semi-definite program is that it's working on a Hilbert space which is, grows exponential in the number of qubits, so that by the time you reach eight or nine qubits, it gets hopeless. So you can't actually, I mean, you can set your, some, your linear program package and start it solving it and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. And unless you get a better linear programming package than we have or do something clever, you're not going to get the solution. So for more qubits, you know, maybe finding a feasible solution to the original which is below the optimum, and then f finding a feasible solution to the dual, which is above the optimum, will give you a pretty good idea of what the optimum is. And in fact, what? Yeah, so yeah, this is the same thing I just said. <laughs> you can, um, you know, if you can't do the semi-definite program, you can use heuristics to find a near optimal solution for the program and a near optimal solution for the dual and bound the optimum between these two solutions. So how well does this work? Well, so Andrew Fletcher and his thesis came up with a very nice heuristic for finding the an upper uh, solution to the dual 
I mean, it would be nicer if we could prove that this heuristic always gives you a value of fidelity that was below one as an upper bound, but we can't. But it seems to work really well. And there he also came up, and he'll be talking about this more, I think, with uh, in his talk with a heuristic for finding a lower bound, which is much, and the heuristic for finding a lower bound, I can actually understand intuitively. It kind of does a decomposition of your channel into subspaces and works on those. The decomposition for the upper bound is, the heuristic for the upper bound is a little less intuitive. Anyway, here's what happens for us so of the five qubit code. We computed the optimal and that's this black line and it's below this heuristic red line, which is a pretty good um, recovery operator and this heuristic and this heuristic solution to the dual program which tells you you can't possibly do better than this dashed red line. And for the green line, well, here's, I don't think you can tell the difference between the, on this plot between the heuristic lower bound and the heuristic upper bound. So this is, the, this curve is, I mean the optimal solution is between these two curves you can't tell apart here. So this is the right solution for recovering from the nine qubit code with a absolute adapting channel with the best um, recovery. And the seven qubit code, the upper bound is quite a bit better than the lower bound, quite a bit above the lower bound. And also, well, the seven qubit code is less than both the nine qubit and the five qubit code. <coughs> so why is that? Well, for the nine qubit code, the reason the bounds are very tight is because this code can correct absolute adapting orders to the second order. So you can look up here and it looks, well, it looks like this is a cubic um, curve instead of this quadratic curve, which it should be if this is a second order. And the heuristics actually manage to figure out that you can correct um, the errors to the second order. So these heuristics are correcting all the second order errors and the difference between them is third order, which is pretty small. Okay, so what else can we do with the dual program? Well, I, I, a lot of times in linear programming, the dual program has an intuitive interpretation that is really useful. Unfortunately, this dual program, you can stare on it and you can kind of see maybe what it's doing, but you can't, you can't get an, in, well, we haven't got to have an, we don't have an intuitive explanation for the dual, which shows it's really useful, but we can, look at the very special case when it's a stabilizer code, and then we can find a solution in the dual, which gives you an upper bound on how well you could possibly do. And what this upper bound says is that the standard recovery is optimal. So what this means is that if you have a stabilizer code and a channel that is a mixture of pally operations, the best thing to do is measure the syndrome, and then once you've measured the syndrome, you do the you know, you do the best possible recovery, which is just figure out what the maximum likelihood error is given that syndrome and the recovery. So this says, well, what this might say, although it's not clear that this is actually what it, I mean, this does not strictly mean this, but it kind of implies that for channels which are mixtures of pally operations, stabilizer co codes might work pretty well on them. Whereas for the amplitude damping channel, stabilizer codes may work a lot, and the best stabilizer codes for the amplitude damping channel may be a lot worse than the best stabilizer codes for pally operation channels. So what is the amplitude damping channel? Well, everybody knows what this is. Rho goes to A1 rho A1 dagger plus A2 rho A2 dagger, where A1 is, you know, you, the a one gets damped by this factor of square root of one minus gamma, and with probability gamma, a one turns into a zero. And if you can rewrite this, A2 is one over ha one half root gamma sigma x plus i sigma y. And so what, where does our code do better for amplitude damping channels? Well, instead of decomposing a damping error to a sigma x syndrome and a sigma y syndrome, 
in which case you would need two, bit, two dimensions of the POVM to correct a, our measurement, to correct a sigma x, and two dimensions of a measurement to correct a sigma y. So you've wasted four dimensions of measurements. You can essentially have one measurement outcome which tells you, recognizes this damping error. So this saves us one degree of freedom, which we can use for er other errors. So dimension counting, which <coughs> is essentially what's going on, although in the optimal, the actual optimal recovery is, uh, it's a quantum operation which doesn't break nicely into, um, <coughs> it doesn't break nicely into uh, measurement followed by a recovery. So, Andrew Fletcher's um, heuristic program actually does break things up into a measurements followed by recoveries. But in the um, you have five qubit code, you have the case of no error and you have five first order damping errors. So this gives you six syndrome, or well, six measurement outcomes which you want to use to correct all first order errors. So now you've used 12 um, dimensions, and you have, you know, 32 dimensions total because your output space is 2 to the fifth. So this gives you 20 dimensions left over for second error order errors. Whereas if you use the standard recovery, you have 15 first order errors you're correcting, a sigma x, a sigma y, and a sigma z for each of the qubits, and then the no error term, and this is 16 times 2 is 32, so you've used all of your um, all of your possible dimensions of measurement on first order errors. So the way, reason that the five qubit code works better is it uses, you know, it, it corrects some number of the second order errors, although not all of them. Okay, and let's go back and look at that. So you can see that, you know, this is a, this still has second order errors because it's not, you know, it has an x squared term, but has a considerably smaller x squared term than this one. And that's where you're picking up your improvement. At least, that's where you're picking up your improvement near the nearly perfect transmission point. Okay. <coughs> so now, let's see. Ah, I think I'm going too fast. <laughs> So now, we're going to go to the four qubit amplitude damping channel. So Debbie Lung and all, et al, which I put that in this time, pro <laughs> so that's Chuang and Nielsen and Yamamoto, proposed a four qubit code for the amplitude damping channel. So a zero gets encoded by one over root two, all zeros plus all ones, and one gets encoded by one over root two, zero, zero, one, one, plus one, one, zero, zero. So this code can correct all one qubit errors. And the optimal error recovery improves it substantially. So if you don't, if you do the syndrome measurement followed by the error recovery on this thing, it actually does around as well as the five cube, the encoding one qubit into five qubit for fidelity. And when you improve it by doing the optimal error probability, it also does around as well as the optimized five qubit code. So um, why does it work? I mean, four qubits is not enough to correct all first order er errors in general first order. Well, <coughs> the reason is, of course, it corrects all first order errors. And suppose there's a damping error on the first qubit. Um, I, that should read second qubit. Suppose there's a damping or, or, er, error, error on the second qubit. What happens to zero sub L? Uh, logical zero is it goes to um, root gamma over root two, which is just a normalization term, times one, zero, one, one. So a one turns into a zero and a zero just goes away. And here, a one turns into a zero and a zero goes away. So you get this. And these, you know, this is a very nice subspace. You've just rotated you know, the subspace alpha zero plus beta one into the subspace alpha this plus beta that. And you haven't distorted it at all. <coughs> so you can, and 
It's also easy to see that these two states are orthogonal to what you get if you have a damping error on any of the other three qubits and orthogonal to the no error. So you get, you know, you can measure the um, damping error on qubit one, damping error on qubit two, damping error on qubit three, damping error on qubit four, or no error, and these are five, um, you know, five two-dimensional measurement outcomes, and then you can correct them. So that's 10 dimensions, and we still have six more dimensions we can start looking for second order errors to fix with. And you also have to worry that the no error subspace is distorted, because here, you know, your no error subspace is going to turn from 0000 plus 1111 to 0000 plus gamma to the fourth 1111. And here the no errors are actually one minus gamma squared, sorry. <laughs> and here the no error subspace does something similar. So the no error subspace gets distorted, but you can compute it. It doesn't get distorted to first order, the distortion of the second order, so this doesn't introduce any first order errors. So, well, that worked really well. So we started doing some dimension counting, and we asked the question, could you have a three qubit error correcting code that corrects amplitude damping errors to first order? So there are eight dimensions in our subspace, and there are four, well, there's the no error, and then there are three possible amplitude damping errors, and two times four equals eight, so dimension counting suggests it might be possible. So what we did was we start, you know, took a random code, we, f we found a whole bunch of good codes for the amplitude damping channel on three qubits by this iterated optimization. You start with a random code, then you find the optimal recovery, then you find the optimal code for that recovery, etc. And we got a whole bunch of results. And there are lots of codes that all worked, and they all looked different, and they all looked pretty good. Our, most of our most of our runs ended up with something that worked pretty well. None of them actually worked to first order. So the open problem is prove that there's no first order error correcting free qubit code. And Debbie would be very happy if you could prove this. So, so I had a uh, undergrad who wanted to do this summer research, this MIT summer research program with me, and I had him looked at these three qubit codes to try to figure out their structures. And I figured that would probably take him, you know, all summer, and maybe we'd learn something from it. Well, it took him like two and a half weeks. <laughs> he looked at them, he figured out that they fell into at least three classes. Our best class was pretty good. The second class was nearly as good and it had a, you know, it had a continuous parameter you could adjust in it. So um, this explains why we were getting lots and lots of codes that looked very different. And then there was a third class which he didn't, which still wasn't quite as good as this and he didn't investigate fully. But if you look at these classes, you know, they tended to group pairs of complementary basis states together, like alpha 0, 1, 0 plus beta 1, 0, 1. And these would be the largest amplitude and they'd be larger than the other amplitudes. And if you rounded off to make these the amplitudes and everything else zero, you got a code that worked essentially as well. And you recall that the four qubit code also had this complementary structure. So this led Lang to propose a much more general class of codes. So what is this? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to choose code words that look like 1 over root 2, S plus S complement, or S bar, where S bar is a complement of S. So Debbie's code looks like this. We have 0, 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1, 1, and 0, 0, 1, 1, and 1, 1, 0, 0. And so we're just going to look for codes that look like this. And now we're going to ask what conditions do we need to make sure they correct all first order errors? Well, let's look at the set of basis vectors S and S bar. So what do we want? 
Well, we want that if you apply an amplitude damping channel, an amplitude damping operation to one of these code words, and apply a different amplitude damping operation on a different qubit to another of these code words, you can still tell them apart when you're done. So we want no two of these vectors to have having distance one because then if you applied an amplitude, so then they differ, then there'd be a position where they differ in a, okay. I shouldn't explain it on this slide, I can explain it on the next slide. So we want no two of these diff vectors to have a having distance one, and if two of these vectors have having distance two, we won't want let them have the same having weight. So we can go back to Debbie's code, and here, you know, one, 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 one has having distance two from one, one, zero, zero, but these don't have the same having weight, so they're okay. So why do we need these conditions? Well, suppose two qubits differed in a Hamming vector had, you know, so the first code word would be this plus the complement, and the second code word would be this plus the complement. And then this, if you applied a damping operation to the second qubit, would it turn, have a big overlap with this, so you couldn't tell them apart. So we don't want that. And if you had two vectors, zero, one, you know, what, with a one, zero here and a zero, one, in the second thing, so these have distance two and they have the same having weight, then we would not tell the, be able to tell the difference between a damping operation on the second bit from this one, which would give you a zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, zero state, and a damping operation on the seventh qubit of this one, which would give you the same state. So we want, you know, we want all of these vectors in the set S and S complement to have Hamming weight one and to no two with Hamming weight two which have the same Hamming, Hamming distance two which have the same Hamming weight. <coughs> so are these conditions sufficient? Well, they are and that last slide doesn't quite do it. There's a couple of other things to check. Essentially, we need to check that if a code word, one of root two S plus S bar has a damping error applied to any of the qubits, it doesn't get annihilated. So why doesn't it get annihilated? Because S and S bar are complements, so if there's a zero in one of these, there's a one in the other, and the damping error just applies to the guy with one, which turns into a zero. So it doesn't get complemented, and you can tell the and then you can measure and tell which qubit had the amplitude damping error applied to it. And we also need to make sure that the no errors for subspace is not distorted to the first order. So we have to make sure that if you have this no error subspace, it's going to get distorted because going back to Debbie's, to um, I guess I should say Lung et al. code, we have this one, 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 one gets multiplied by square root of one minus gamma to the fourth, so it gets a one minus gamma squared operation on it, and this gets no operation, and this gets zero, zero, one, one, and one, one, zero, zero, so those are both one minus gammas. But you get, you know, a first order it looks like this is a one, this is a one minus two gamma, and this is a gamma, one minus gamma, and this is a one minus gamma. So both of them, you know, when you average, you get one minus gamma, um, you know, amplitudes, and that's enough to be able to restore these two things. So, what did we do? We looked for code words. How do we look for code words? Well, it's a maximum clique problem. You look at all, I mean, we're trying to throw things of S plus S bar into, into our code. And we have conditions on pairs of these that say either this can go in or this can go in, but not both. And you want to find the most things you can stick in. So that is a maximum clique problem. And you know, this is exactly the same problem you solve for code word 
stabilized codes as we heard earlier this week. And we used a very unsophisticated, well, greedy clique algorithm. You start throwing things in until you're all done. And then you try again from a different start, you know, with different randomization. And you keep on doing it and see how well you can do. And we get these results. So for n equals, say, 10, we got 41 code words. And you can check that these are better than the best single error correcting stabilizer codes that, so if you're looking for a single error correcting stabilizer code, um, I don't know what 10 gets, but it's less than 41. And what do these codes look like? Well, I have a couple of examples for small things. Um, n equals 6 is the smallest one that really isn't trivial. And what does this look like? Well, I mean, so Debbie's, so Lung et al, the code word, you know, so this is very similar to code word of Lung et al, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, plus 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and zeros, and 0, 0, and 1s. And then 1, 1 in the middle, and 0, 0 in the middle, 1, 1 on the right, and 0, 0 on the right. So these first four code words form a stabilizer code, which is the generalization of Lung et al's code. But then you can throw this one in too. 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, plus 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Because, you know, if you delete any of these ones, it doesn't overlap with any of these guys. So you squeeze one more code word in. And a larger example, for n equals 8, k equals 12, we get, um, well, the first eight code words. <coughs> so here, instead of writing all these code words down, we, we could just write one of these two um, s's, and then you would know you'd have to put in s bar for the complement. So here, we have eight code words, and we can add these four things in, which look fairly random. And there may be some structure here, but we haven't, we haven't looked hard for it, and we haven't found it. And yeah, so this is what they look like. So now, you know, over the last, you um, know, since this work was done, I've been thinking about how to generalize this to two error correcting codes, because those are all just one error correcting codes. And there's a nice way to do it, which also fits in these code word stabilized codes. And I can tell you how it should work. Unfortunately, I have not done any programming or computation, so I don't actually have any codes that fit in this class of codes. I was hoping that by this time I gave this talk, I would have managed to do that, but um, this is, yeah, there hasn't been any time. So suppose you take a linear code, so that each pair of coordinates, so this is for two error correcting, um, presumably it will work just the same for k error correcting, although um, I haven't checked it carefully. So you take a linear code so that each pair of coordinates, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, appear an equal number of times. So that's our linear code, classical linear code C. Now let's define a code word C plus W to be summation over all, the, just the coset of C when you um, add W to all the code words. So our, and then you take the superposition of the coset. So our code will consist of C plus W for some set of W. So we can ask, what conditions do we need on the set C plus W? So all the basis states that for lie in all these code words. Well, it's nearly the same. We need that if we change 0, 1, or 2 ones to zeros in any of the two strings in C plus W, they don't collide. Because if they collided, then you couldn't tell uh, amplitude damped amplitude damping on one, you know, applied to one of these from the amplitude damping applied to the other one. So we also need to check that the no error subspace is not distorted up to second order. 
And the nice thing is that this follows from the condition that the code C contains an equal number of pairs 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1 in every pair of positions. Good? So, can we find good two error correcting codes for the amplitude damping channel? Which, well, first thing we need to do is find a, choose a good code C. And then, we need to find the maximum number of code words we can f obtain in the form of C plus W, and that's, again, a maximum clique problem. So how do we find this code C? What does these conditions really mean? Well, if C is linear, if you, you will have pairs 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1 equally often in every pair of positions, exactly if the dual code to C has no code words of weight 2 or less, so it has minimum weight 3. Why is that? Well, I mean, just because of linearity, if you get any subset of these, you'll get all of them equally often, and they'll form a subspace. So the only things you have to worry about is if they have, you know, if all of the codes have 0, 1, or 0, if, you know, the only thing you have to worry about is if there's one position that is always zero, and then the dual code will have a weight one code word, or if there's one position which is always either zero, zero, or one, one. And then the dual code will have a weight two code word, which is just one, one there. So we need a C perp to have minimum weight three, so it's a one error correcting code, and then we can take C and it has this property we want it. So this is looking an awful lot like CSS codes. You want a minimum weight high code C and then you want to find as many C plus W's as you can which have this condition that they don't collide. So, yeah, I said this before, these are code word stabilized codes. You start with a stabilizer code word C, and then you add as many code words as you can of the form GC, where G is a tensor product of sigma X's. And for the case of one error correcting codes that Reit and Lang discovered, C is just the cat state, all zeros plus all ones. Okay, and I think I'm, <laughs> ending a little bit early, but that's, that's okay. So you can ask, are there other, I have a few open questions I wrote down. There's probably tons more open questions you can think of. Are there other kinds of code word stabilized codes which are good for amplitude damping channel? Are, are, I mean, so this is some subclass of code word stabilized codes that are good for the amplitude jamming channel. Are there other classes of code word stabilized codes? Or have we found the right set of conditions? And what about other stabilizer codes that work well for the amplitude damping channel? I think Andrew Fletcher might be talking more about this in a few hours. And then you can ask, are these codes useful in any way for fault tolerance? So one thing you might think about is using the first layer of concatenation to protect against amplitude damping if, I mean, if you have some system where most of the errors in the amplitude damping, as of the amplitude da damping form, you can, maybe you want to just use a first layer of concatenation codes to protect just against amplitude damping and subsequent layers to protect against other errors. So to do this, you'd have to somehow find a way of doing fault tolerant computing with some of these codes that are good against amplitude damping. And it'd be nice if we could do that. Okay, any questions? should have said is the maximum likely, you, you want to find 
Yeah, this is for, let's see. Yeah, if, if you have a degenerate code, then there are going to be several code word, several, you could correct several errors at once. You want to, you are going to want to group them together. You're right. We've checked it against. Uh, if, if we know it's, if we we're, if we assume it's just amplitude damping, and we optimize it for some parameter of the amplitude damping, it works very well for nearby parameters. So if you get instead, you know, instead of a 0.2 optimal damping channel, you get 0.17. It's going to be very good for that. For this two error correcting codes, yeah. Well, I, and you know, any, um, you know, a, the dual of any three error correcting code would be good, and you want to choose a largest three error, largest not three error, one error correcting code would be good, and you want to choose the largest code you can possible with that, because that will give you the smallest set C, which should give you the most flexibility. So read molar codes would probably be a, you know, good choice. Yeah. But we haven't done any, comp well, I mean, a actually, if you have the number of qubits larger than, you know, anything, yeah, I don't know how, how large we can go with these, um, you know, searching for these code word stabilized codes, but if you choose a number of qubits more than 10 or 20, this maximization problem is probably hopeless. Although we could find, you know, we could try to find good cliques, although we won't find the best ones. Um, well, that's not going to do much better than just using the stabilizer code and the standard recovery on the amplitude damping channel because that's, I mean, if you use the stabilizer code and the amplitude damping, if you use the stabilizer code and the standard recovery, essentially what you're doing is, um, is essentially what you're doing some kind of, uh, essentially what you're doing is averaging over, I mean, you're, you're looking at the errors at sigma x and the basis sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, that's very similar to what twirling is doing. So I think twirling is going to, um, you'll lose all the amplitude damping, you'll lose all the, what you could ga have gained from the amplitude damping channel by using twirling is my guess.